You're listening to The Real Talk Real Estate Show with your host, Clayton Heffler. As the owner of Kahuna Investments, Corey strives to provide his investors with stable returns and long-term capital appreciation by buying simply multifamily apartments. Now, Corey has actively managed and operated over $95 million in real estate across the country, and he has a specific uh, wheelhouse of uh, the student rental niche. He's also an author of Copy Your Way to Success, Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, and host of another podcast, the Multifamily Legacy Podcast. He speaks around the country on this subject, including at Harvard and at the NASDAQ. Wow. And he has some excellent concepts today that we explore about raising private money, uh, real estate investing in single family homes versus multifamily, and why never asking people for money is the right way to get your money in your next capital raising endeavor. Welcome to the Real Talk Real Estate Investing Podcast. Yeah, well, hey, thanks for having me on. You know, uh, I start off like a lot of people, which is like broke and crying and really wanting to do real estate. Um, I was a used car salesman until my wife said that I couldn't be uh, that anymore. She said I needed to have a real job. So then I was actually managing restaurants. Um, you know, I barely met out of high school. Um, I find that when you don't have a degree, you got to either uh, manage some crap or you sell some crap. And I chose oh. the sales route and I sold used cars, right? So, um, but, you know, I discovered, I got the download from the mothership um, a little bit later in life. It wasn't until I was like 32 and that I actually realized what I wanted to do when I grew up. And, um, you know, I read this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, by Robert Kiyosaki. And when I read it, I actually had a real life mentor and I didn't really realize it at the time, but uh, almost 18 years ago, something magical happened. My mom was married to this man named Bruce. I call him Bruce Wayne. Um, he wasn't Batman, but he was loaded. And he had a lot of money. And he actually had a house in Hawaii. And so my wife and I, and my mom was married to this guy. And, and she invited us to go to Hawaii. And come to find out, he's got a house right on the beach. And I remember looking at his house and what he had and and his phone wasn't ringing. He had time and money. You could tell no one had their finger on him. And I remember asking him, like, what do you do? And he said he owned real estate and specifically apartments. Mm. And uh, But when I was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, after that, you know, I'd come back from the island. So I left the island thinking Bruce was the big kahuna. Like, he had time and money. Oh. No doubt in my mind. And so uh, I read the book, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I realized right there that that's what I wanted to do. And so um, I started my company in 2005, and I named it Kahuna Investments, because I wanted to be the big kahuna just like Bruce. And so I went on a journey, man. I started off as a wholesaler, because I had no money, no credit, and I was just trying to figure out real estate. I wish I would do what I do now, which is only apartments. I, did, I had to learn the hard way, which was I started wholesaling. Then I actually learned how to raise private money. Mm. So early on, I learned how to raise private money because there was no money in like 2009 and 10 from the banks. So you had mm -hmm. to get it from private people. That's the only way you could do it. And I did it by accident. I actually learned how to raise money by accident. I'll tell the story in a bit. But really from, from there, I started doing fix and flips and I was – really successful doing fix and flips. But if you looked at my life from the inside, you would see that I was a complete train wreck because all I was doing was going and from property to property, chasing money, becoming a bad dad and just everything about it. It was horrible experience where I was letting my kids down and really doing it the wrong way. And then I found apartments and brother, let me just tell you apartments, uh, you know, it's a, something sexy about cash flow, and it really does make a difference. Cash flow, I believe, is the name of the game. Okay, so tell, t t I, I'm totally in that because as I we spoke a little bit beforehand, I wholesale and 
quite a few houses and know that, you know, as soon as you, as soon as you cash that check, you're, you're, you're driving out to another property. And yeah. It, every it, day you got to start yeah. back from zero. Um, so I, I'd like to hear uh, a little bit about your experience with uh, raising private money, especially because a lot of uh, the people, like I said, that listen to this podcast are millennials or younger. They're, they're, they're yeah. at the fundamental steps. And I like one of your concepts that the right people always self select. Can you go into that a little bit? Uh, I think oh, it's really helpful. Boy, brother. Hell yeah. You've been reading my book, haven't you? <laughs> okay. So listen, and, and listen, everybody that's listening, hold on for a minute because this, this stuff right now that I'm going to talk about, you should really pay attention to because out of all the things that I've figured out in my life, the one thing that may, that really moved the needle the most is this coming up, right? Is the ability to raise money. Um, I'm assuming just like everybody else listening to this podcast, when you start, you're broke. And after one deal, you run out of money. Even if you think you got money, you'll run out of money. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're all going to need to learn how to raise capital. Um, but it's not going, everybody thinks raising money is going to the bank or going to the private money lender or hard money lender, or like, you know, those expensive places. Cause he who has the money usually sets all the rules mm -hmm. unless you find the right kind of people. I would say there's lots of ponds to fish in, right? And you want to fish in the people that are looking for people like us. And so, so let me equate that to what that means. So, when you're doing deals, whether it's even flipping, but or specifically in apartments, you know, let's say you have a, an apartment, you know, 12, 20 plex, you need a half a million dollars. You may need five people with a hundred thousand dollars. And the best way to illustrate this is just to tell you how I raised my first piece of money, right? I was wholesaling and I was just making like two or $3,000 a deal wholesaling. Yet I was working with these guys that were rich, that had lots of money. And, you know, every time, and I was managing their rehab, so I was doing all the work, but these guys were making $30,000. Corey Peterson was making $3,000. Mm -hmm. Not fair, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so I, I raised my first piece of money by accident. I was playing racquetball with one of, uh, I used to be a financial advisor, by the way. I actually got smart and, got, and, and actually learned how to pass the test. And I passed my series seven, like by 73, me 70 to win and 73 is what I got. So <laughs> I just studied, I studied a little too much, but I passed that. But I, I learned from the company all about raising money. And this was one of my old ex clients. And I didn't think he had any money. And so I wasn't asking him for money. I was actually asking him for help. So his name was Carl. I'm playing racquetball with Carl's older guy. He's like 65, still beats me, by the way, sometimes on the court. Guy's really good. And so I was like, Carl, man, you're watching me wholesale these deals and everything that I'm doing. Because I we shared about business a lot and talking. And, you know, I, I'm holding, getting these deals and then these guys are making the money. I want to flip the script. I want to make all the money. I want to pay interest, kind of like the fee that I was making. I could give someone like a note and deed of trust. And Carl, you know, you live in a retirement community. Do you know of anybody that would want to do that? And so he was like, well, I'll go see and we'll see what I can do. Well, the next day, guess who calls me? It's Carl, right? And he's like, hey, Corey, uh, you know, hey, do you still want to do that 12%? And I was like, sure. And in the back of my mind, I was like, man, Carl found somebody. He goes, well, you know, Corey, you don't know this but my home is totally paid for and I can borrow money at 3%. If you give me 12, I can make a spread. How much money do you need? It was at that moment that I'm, you know, cause this is a pivotal moment for Corey. Carl, I need $85,000. And there was a slight pause. And then he's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, where do you want me to send it? And I'm telling you, just like that, my draw dropped. And I was like, uh, uh, uh. Because I didn't even know where, like, what I'm supposed to do next. Mm -hmm. But I learned two things out of that. Number one, never ask people for money. Just don't do it. 
ask people who do they know. See, what I realized what I did was with Carl is I was just sharing him my vision or what we'll call my business plan or my pitch deck or what I was doing. And I was asking him to poke some holes in it. And I was asking him because I wanted him to refer me to somebody that may work. And in the process, what I found is that the right people will always, always self-select and say, well, hold on. Because A, number one, they're critically looking at your stuff mm -hmm. because you've, you're asking them, you took all the pressure by saying, hey, I'm not, I'm not interested in you. you know, I, I want your friends and I want you to make sure that this is cool. Mm -hmm. so now they're really looking at it. And when they're really looking at it, they might come to the conclusion, well, crap, you know, what, this sounds pretty good. What, mm -hmm. what about me? You know, and they self-select. They say, can I invest in your deal? Just like Carl did. And that's how I've raised, you know, last year we raised $10 million of OPM, other people's money. Um, this year, not as big, we didn't have as many deals, but we raised uh, 5.5 5 .5 million. And um, so private capital, out of the, all the things that I've learned how to do, raising private money is the one that has set me apart from people that started in the same time that I did. And the reason why I have a, quite a few more zeros to the end of my net worth. Right. Right. So and I want to pay taxes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, so I, I want to jump into that because I, I just love it so much. And, and um, I was, I was listening to something by Kiyosaki, right? And he, you know, he, he, he can be pretty blunt in how he describes things. And he said, stupid people use their own money. Wealthy people use other people's money. And that stuck to me. And, and then you said the right people always self-select. And I'm thinking back, Corey, on the first time that I first reached out to some of my family and friends and I did not do the, hey, do you know anyone? I said, hey, this is what I'm doing. You know, the, like, would you mind helping me out? But I want to go to that first deal. Tell me a little bit about the first deal because you, it sounds like the structure of your, the money that you raised was debt versus equity, which is some, something that I think our listeners would appreciate that structure. And how do you raise yeah. money now? Is it primarily equity or is it? It's all equity. So I'm, I'm going to okay. show you how to even transition, right? So for anybody that's out there fixing, flipping, and, you, and, you, and you're just trying to figure out how to get some more money, like, first of all, there's two things you need when you're raising money for single family homes. And then I'm going to talk about multis too. Okay. Cool. Cool. So A, you need what's called a private money program. See, once I discovered Carl, because I equate that to like going into the telephone booth, it's like Clark, Clark Kent. I mean, yeah. this is not good for millennials. Maybe I'm going in as freaking Thor's. I don't know. But I spun <laughs> around and, and I come out Superman. So again, Superman's who my uh, guy was, right? Superman. I come out as Superman. And so, uh, but, but the truth is, is, you know, when I opened up my eyes and said, hey, there's got to be some people out there that are really doing raising capital. And what do they, what do they use? What do they have? And what I realized is they have, a private money program. So this is for single family homes mm -hmm. is you want to have a private money program that just kind of says, here's how we take money. Here's how, uh, here's our process and it, and here's what we pay. And in other words, it's your rule book. Here's how people work with me and how they give me their money. And that's really, really valuable by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second is your credibility kit which is just your before and afters. So it could be like, here's what I do. I buy crap like this. I fix it up and it looks like this and I sell it and I make this much profit and just have, and if you don't have a credibility kit, go partner with someone that does and use their crap. Yeah. Right. Like all you gotta do is have a story, man. And it's gotta be able to, I mean, with technology and pictures and stuff and you can like, that's all I bet. That's how I did it. That's how I went out and took that structure of, Hey, I need to find money. And then I kept finding more and more people because I created a little program that says, Hey, Hey, Corey, what do you do, man? I, I get money from investors just, you know, all the time. They give me money to fund deals that, that do, that do this. I show my credibility kit. Oh, well, how does that work? Oh, no problem. Well, let me give you my private money program. Right. And let's, you know, and Hey, you know, or Hey, listen, and when you do that, when I ask for it, Hey, 
you know, why don't you go ahead and, and poke some holes in it because I would love to be able to, uh, uh, you to refer me some of your friends. Mm. And then they'll be like, well, hell, maybe what about me? And that's, that really is this, the same process. Now, that's debt. So, so that's where I'm saying I'm giving a, someone a note and deed of trust, right? And it is easier to raise debt and you don't have to pay as much money for debt, right? I think if I was raising money uh, for debt right now, I'd be charging maybe 7%, maybe 6 right? Because it's how money's chasing, you know, that kind of stuff um, with no pref. And also because like in my, in my private money program, if I'm doing a fix and flip, do I want to, uh, make payments? You want to make monthly payments? No, you don't want to make monthly payments. So you write in your rules, we don't make monthly payments. We, we settle up at the end. Why? Mm. Because see, with, when you go to a private money lender, what do they give you? The terms. Here's the terms that you have to abide by for us to give you money, right? Mm. And what I did is just reverse engineer it and say, hey, here's my terms if you want to give me your money. This is how I work. If you don't want to work this way, no problem. Someone else give me some money. Oh, oh, well, don't do that. Hold on. You know, like, you know, it's it's all mindset. It's, it's really mind screwing people into that psychology is people want what they can't have. So, so, so if, you, I'm hearing you, if I'm hearing you correctly, and I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to make sure that our audience understands this perfectly. You are saying if, if someone, you know, someone in our audience wants to start buys a small single family rental, duplex, truck, whatever, something smaller. You say, yeah. Here, here's how we take the money. Here's how we're going to use it. This is exactly what we're going to do. So say you borrow $100,000 at 7%, right? 7%. Yeah. You yep. say, we're not making any monthly payments, but what we're going to do is at the end, the 7% aggregated over that period of time is going to be paid to you. Yep. Boom. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Because I didn't want to make payments. I didn't want to have to bankroll that too. Because mm. I ain't got no money. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Keep going. This is great. This is good stuff. Okay. So, um, so that was the story. So I just started showing it. So, that's what I did when I was doing single family flicks. Now I transitioned to apartments in 2011 and now we own like a hundred million dollars worth of uh, properties and um, like over 2000 units. I hate to like get into how many units you got. Cause I really don't care. I got seven active projects and I, and I own a really 60% or better on most of them like ownership. Right. Mm. So sometimes, you know, you hear people, I think the percentage of what people owns cause people can say, Oh, I own, 3,000 doors, but they own like 1%, by the way. Right. That really, that really just pisses me off sometimes when I hear people like try to Tommy top about how many doors they own. And, and honestly, it's like, listen, let's just compare NOIs, right? Like, let's just, let's just, or let's compare net profits. I'm down with that too, right? Let me show you how sexy that looks, right? Right. Then we'll talk and see who's got, you know, who, if the water's deep or cold or whatever or what. So, <laughs> so how did you go from uh, single family, this pitch deck, Hey, I'm going to get 85 grand or whatever yep. to multifamily. So really easy transition was to say, guys, this was when the market was like 2011 is when the market was changing. At least for me, it was because up until then I was doing REOs and short sales. So I was just going on MLS and finding my single family home deals. And once that started to dry up, I'm like, Oh crap, my cheese is moving. I got to find it. And I'd, and at that point, I'd raised, I was raising like like two or three million dollars of private capital, and I already knew the capital is what was important. Like, listen, the money's not even real estate, guys. I I know that sounds weird, but money, the money is not in apartments. It's not in single families. The money is in the money. Hmm. Trust me on this, right? If you can raise capital, you will find deals. The the vehicle is apartments and real estate, but the money is in, in, is in money, is learning how to master this game. You will be way more valuable to people and to deals than, than anything else that you could possibly do, hmm. right? And so how I transitioned was, hey guys, the market's changing, um, we're moving into apartments. It's just kind of like what you're doing, except that you don't have to give me your money and I give it back to you and then you give it back to me and then I give it back to you. And like we do that like five times during a year 
And sometimes if I don't have a deal, it's not working. So it's dead money. And so, you know, I just told a different story and here's why you're going to like the apartments. And, you know, when you start selling apartments, you're like, apartments are like factories that take, you know, collect rent checks each and every month. And it goes through a grinding profit and it spits out profits out the back door, you know, that go to our investors, right? These are like little cities that run and, you know, not, and, and we're not worried about if five or 10 people don't show up for work that day, right? Mm. Because we have a whole, you know, manufacturing uh, plant working. I like using that analogy of, of, of like a, a plant because people can see it in their minds and they understand that rent checks, you know, everybody's got to pay rent, rent's due. Mm. And so when I explained it to that in that shape and form and say, here's what our expectations are, you know, and then, um, it really is, it's just the same. It's just, it's a little different, but it's a different vehicle. So you just talk about the vehicle. And what I've learned is that, listen, money is everywhere. There's all types of money, but all types of money, they're looking for people like us, deal makers. Because listen, what are we experiencing right now in the stock market? Records, right? And what goes up eventually has to do what? Come down. Come down, man. And so wouldn't it be a good time right now to take some of that profit off the table and invest in some real estate? Because what I found about real estate is it's really consistent. Rents gradually go up, but they don't normally go down. If they go down, it's very small. And they're usually really consistent. Rents usually always going up. Like, listen, my tenants expect rents to go up and I never disappoint them. Mm. Right? Ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, even if it's You're 10 consistent. bucks. You're consistent, man. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but by raising $10 every property, um, you know, and, and every unit, I mean, that adds up over time to a lot of money and it creates a lot of value. And so raising private capital is the best thing that you could ever, ever do for yourself. So, mm. yeah. Okay. So I want to jump into, uh, I'll give some, you a big giveaway if you want it. I would love a giveaway. You want, you want to give me some, okay. So, uh, I don't ever usually do this, but I would do this for you. I mean, like, so, um, I have this whole course. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a sweet course called RPM raising private money. So if your people will text uh, RPM to 480-500-1127, text RPM, and then just follow the stuff to do it, they'll get my whole course for free. I think we sell it for like 600 bucks. And it's a good, like, it's the best course that I have. 480-500-1127. Yep, T uh, text in RPM. Okay. I'll put that in the show notes. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's what I, I was actually going to get down on that, but I guess the course will explain it. So I want to go to shift gears a little bit. Um, everyone has a specific niche that they like to focus in. I've heard that you have a couple of student housing projects. Yep. Yep. Half of my portfolio is student housing. Yes. So could you tell us a little bit about your reasoning behind student housing um, why you feel really comfortable with that niche. First of all, I'd like to first go into what made you attracted to that. So our, so our listeners can say, okay, Corey is accomplished. He has over a hundred million dollars. Um, but most, most importantly, this is how he thinks about how to go and, uh, and look at deals. Yeah. So I started with, uh, you know, doing seventies and eighties, uh, you know, B and C class properties, but with the student housing, we just been able to pick up some, a newer vintage, like 2006-ish properties. Now, student housing is rented by the bed. And so you've got to have a management company that can understand it, right? Because it is very much a one-time shot at the whole lease up. Mm. So in other words, fall, how, you know, fall semester for college uh, is, um, you know, that Jan, you know, June, July, August, three months, you have three months to kind of rent up the whole place. And um, now there's still like, you have, you know, freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors. 
So they tend to stay for a little bit, but it's really a, a very intensive process. But here's the great news about that is it's a very easy business. Now for us, when we buy student housing, proximity to college is everything. We will not buy a student housing deal unless we're like right across the street. Now, most of our student housing projects are not in these big ass schools, right? Like they're, they're just division two schools. That's fine with us. We don't need to be at OU or any of the big Ohio state or stuff like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But, but there's lots of colleges out there and, but we typically will get a, a nicer, newer vintage. And I like that. So it's not as much maintenance. And then, um, but if you will go get to know the athletic director, everybody in financial aid and everybody in all the coaches, that's what our managers are tasked to do because they'll want to stay. If you have a property really right next to the campus or the closest to the campus after, you know, any of the uh, college housing is done, mm -hmm. um, you will compete, right? You will compete. And a lot of those students that are the coaches, uh, kids, um, they're going to want to live at your place. And the, you know, the athletic director, they want to make sure their students are safe. You know, their athletes are safe. And so if you can have clean, safe, disciplined properties, we call discipline. That's a big part of what we do is, you know, we don't want smoke and joke and uh, we want kids who want to go to school and study and, and have a good college experience, but we're not letting the keg parties happen at our place. Right. We shut it down. And part of how we do that is we make our managers live on site and our maintenance guy lives on site um, because we have to own that product. We have to be really involved in it. But the reason I love it is because a, it creates a lot of income, right? I mean, if you, if you can, like we took over a property uh, three years ago, our first student housing is 508 beds and our total income was around 195 a month. That's where it was averaging under the old leases. But when we had our fall semester and our turn at that, we went to 225 immediately. And all we did was fill it up, like completely. So that 195 to 225 is $30,000. 30 times 12 is, you know, 360 divided by a seven cap is 5 million bucks. I was going to say, whoa. So we made five million bucks just by by filling up the property. It's, we didn't even raise the rents. We're raising the rents now. <laughs> but all we do is fill that property up, and we're making some gang load of money, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, that's that's interesting, and and I'm sure hit that hit pocket national bank, man. We're in that. That's a, that's a game that we're all trying to play, right? Yeah. Okay. So so um, I'd like to jump into a couple of our uh, fire round questions. Uh, these questions have been found to really help our listeners learn a lot about you quickly and provide a ton of value. Um, let me let me take that back. I don't like when people say provide value. Opportunities for them to learn. <laughs> so what's your what's your real estate superpower that makes you a deadly, uh, really successful investor? I hold the BMF title in raising capital, bro. <laughs> and if you know what BMF is, <laughs> <laughs> I know what it is, brother. Okay, <laughs> okay. And 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 I love I love that um, that we'll have the opportunity to look into that um, uh, your course, which I'll put in our show notes. And the mo most importantly, going to someone and saying, "Hey, would you poke? Would you take it upon yourself and give me advice?" Because yeah, I need your help, man. I need your help. Especially as millennials, how powerful is that, right? Like, listen, you don't have to have it all figured out. The whole thing that you got to be the smartest kid on the on the face of the earth, listen, I barely made it out of high school. I've spent my whole life learning from others and saying, hey, man, uh, I'm like special needs over here. I need some help. Can you poke some holes in it and see if I am did my math wrong? Right. And I've always got good results from it, man. There we go. I love it. Uh, so what's your number one uh, recommended, besides your own, real estate book? Um, I would say uh, I like Richest Man in Babylon. Um, mm -hmm. And what I pull away from that is a tenth of everything I make is mine to keep. 
Um, a lot of people are good at making money, but are they saving any of it for themselves? And I truly believe you got to pay yourself. So I found this question, the next question, to be really helpful um, in painting a picture. Um, oh, yeah, you're... And, and let, me give, let me give you one more too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another one is called "Turn the Ship Around." Turn the ship around. It's called. There's. It's a book that's about um, this uh, uh, submarine captain that really created on um, the USS Santa Fe, and he really talks about how he created a different culture of like a leader, leader type of. Um, mentorship in other words when you have employees when you start taking on people that you want them to be like thinking you don't want to be just like the boss and you got to give direction and give them answers you want them to be proactive to where they're already thinking the answers and bringing solutions to you and that's like a leader leader type of uh, uh, community so uh, th that's a um, turn the ship around. I got that. Um, so what do you use? I, I love to ask this question because again, this gives, gives a lot of context when you're starting out and you haven't done ever real estate ever. Um, you're like, okay, I just someday maybe I'll achieve it. What do you use all your wealth? Is there a specific thing that you like to do that maybe you weren't able to do whenever you were wholesaling and now that you have a hundred million dollars that you could do? Shed a little bit of light for our listeners. I have a term that I call supplier of fun. Okay, listen, I, I am past the days of I got to make a paycheck to make money. And honestly, money doesn't even excite me anymore. But supplier of fun, now that gives me purpose. And mm -hmm. just so you can understand what that means is like last year we went to Hawaii and I brought 10 of our neighbors and I paid for everything. I, they actually wanted to pay for their flights. So I let them pay for the flights, but I paid for the sweet house right on the beach and all the stuff that we did. And I got to supply some fun and giving people <laughs> experiences is way, is the, one of the coolest things you can do, man. Yeah, that's, that's fire good. fun. That's, that's a, I love that. I love it. I, I, all the, the, the response is always so cool because people are like, you know, uh, Oh, let me tell you that. Let me tell you this tip, how to do this fundamental thing. Really? It's like, why do you work out? Why do you do this? You want to look sexy to work out number one. Okay, cool. But like you want to be healthier, but you really want to look sexy. What do you do with the money that you make from real estate? You're the supplier of fun. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so what, what was your biggest challenge in real estate getting into the multifamily state or learning how to fail, hmm. learning how to fail. What I've learned, what I've learned is that you have to embrace failure and it's part of the growth. Um, I've not just failed one time. I failed a million times, man. I've made so many mistakes. I've made every mistake. I think maybe sometimes twice. And, um, but I'm so more, they call that experience, by the way, experience is the summation of your success and your failures. But I always say, what do you learn faster from, from your failures, man, mm -hmm. you learn ways not to do crap. Um, and so you try it a different way. And, and so I've learned to, and, and in the beginning though, that was hard. It was hard to face failure. And, um, and like, I'm still a human being. I'm not a Superman. Right. Um, and my um, when when adversity really comes, it's very challenging in the beginning to say I am and I can and I will and I must. Um, but you've you still got to go do it. You got to find it deep inside and, and really have that resolve. It won't feel good. But as you start getting into it and, and here I am, I'm 46. My 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 I got gray, bro. I'm not a millennial. Right. I'm an old fart. But now, but my mind is still active and is sharp today, probably even better. But I look back at those times that were tough and hard and those memories are the best, man, because I can look back and say, damn, it was, that's bad. I don't want to say, I don't want to say that. I don't want to cuss, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like it is dude, like that's the best feeling. And listen, and because I came from nothing, I'm telling you, no one can touch me, bro. Like there's not a, there's not a person out there that put their thumb on Corey Peterson because you have no idea where I came from. And listen, I'm living my best life. Mm -hmm. So, but I had to learn how to fail and do it with grace and, and understand that that was really just part of the process. 
The supplier of fun. I love it. So before, before I ask you my last question, uh, how can our guests get a hold of you? Um, you know, the easiest way, uh, two ways. One, you go to my podcast, Multifamily Legacy Podcast. We got lots of good stuff out there. And then if you want to go to kahunawealthbuilders.com, um, that's my website where we, uh, we have some you know, like a quick start workshop and some other things, whatever. But yeah, we're out there. Cool. What drives you to keep investing and growing? I love the game, man. Like, listen, I don't know about you, but like I grew up playing Monopoly. I love the game of Monopoly, man. And I finally learned how to just buy the red houses now, right? That's all I do is buy the red. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and honestly, if I don't even have like a, a goal anymore, it's just saying, Hey, listen, if I can do two or three projects a year, man, it's, even if I only did just one, like last year, 2019, we only bought one deal and that was, that was fine. I just like playing Monopoly and I can probably play Monopoly for life. Um, at the way, at, at, at my pace and my rate on my terms, I, I don't think I'll ever do it until I die. Like stop. Because like, I, I'm not working too hard, and um, and I enjoy what I do, and I just like playing the game. I like doing something, mm -hmm. and I like to travel a lot too. <laughs> Hawaii, that's it, bro. Yeah, we Corey, go beach, thank bro. You. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, really appreciate it. I'm gonna put again, uh, multifamily legacy podcast. Uh, all the notes that I have and the text message so that our listeners can get that bonus. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. That's it, bro. We go beach. Love it.